Hello, for the rest of this week, we will simply practice saying hello in all the languages we have learned so far, and I may mix them up. Are you ready? Okay. Japanese. Konnichiwa. Sign language. Swahili. Habari. And last but not least, Korean. Anyang Haseo. If you got them all right, congratulations. If not, just continue practicing for the rest of this week and you'll get the hang of it. Kudos to Ezra Jack Keats, who broke the color barrier in children's literature with the success of The Snowy Day in 1962. He believed that all children should be able to see themselves in the books they love. He was one of the first children's book authors to use an urban setting for his stories. An urban setting is where many people live and work close together. Buildings are close together, unlike farmland. Urban is the opposite of rural. Urban areas are usually cities and towns. Now for our book of the day, John Henry, an American Legend by Ezra Jack Keats. A hush settled over the hills. The sky swirled soundlessly round the moon. The river stopped murmuring. The wind stopped whispering. And the frogs and the owls and the crickets fell silent, all watching and waiting and listening. Then the river roared. The wind whispered and whistled and sang. The frogs croaked, the owls hooted, and all the crickets chirped. Welcome, welcome, echoed through the hills. And John Henry was born, born with a hammer in his hand. Bang, 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 rang little John Henry's hammer through the cabin as he crawled about. What's that rascal up to now, his mother chuckled. <laughs> And before she knew it, he was big enough to help her around the house. As he grew up, he did a man's work with his father. One day, John Henry thought, I'm taller and stronger than anyone around. It's time I went out into the world. He said goodbye to his mother and father, and off he went. He worked on farms and in cotton fields, but all that was too tame. So he got himself a job on a riverboat. One stormy night, the ship plowed through the darkness. Suddenly, the big steel rod that turned the paddle wheel broke. The wheel stopped turning. Smash! Went the rod through the bottom of the ship. Pump water! shouted the captain. Get to port before we sink! John Henry leaped to the paddle wheel crank. He seized it, pushed and grunted and pulled. Slowly, the giant wheel turned. With all his strength, he kept it turning. Lord Almighty, help us, someone whispered in that long, dark night. As the day broke, they sighted shore and pulled into port. A thunderous cheer went up for John Henry. John Henry felt a new excitement in the air. Men were talking of railroads being built from the Atlantic to the Pacific. They're going to lay those tracks over rivers, across prairies and deserts and right through mountains and through Indian lands and stampeding buffalo herds and bad lands. Goodbye, boys, cried John Henry. I'm going to swing me a hammer on them beautiful new tracks. My hands are just itching to hold a hammer again, John Henry said. He tried one for size and left. <laughs> it sure does feel fine. How he drove those spikes, singing to the clanking of his hammer. The men joined in, their voices singing, hammers ringing, and John Henry's gang was in the lead as day after day, the tracks moved steadily westward. 
Rising across their path was a sprawling mountain range. Its snow-capped peaks reached high into the clouds. We'll have to tunnel through, said his friend Lil Bill. It'll be awful dangerous. Could be cave-ins, someone put in. That suits me fine, said John Henry. Me too, added Lil Bill. Here's how we'll do it, boys, the foreman called out. A couple of men will drive a hole into the rock. Then the powder men will put dynamite into the hole and explode it. The others will cart the loose rock away. We'll do this again and again until we have a tunnel right through this mountain. And it's going to be a real big tunnel, boys. Big enough for a giant locomotive pulling one of them long strings. Old trains. All right, boys. Blast away. Deep into the mountain they worked as John Henry singing echoed through the tunnel. The powder men got ready to blast more rock. They filled a hole with dynamite, put in a long fuse, and lit it. Run, men! cried the four men. They all scrambled back, ready to dash clear of the blast. At that instant came a great cracking and rumbling and the entire tunnel trembled around them. It's a cave-in! We're trapped! There was no place to run. The fuse burned closer to the dynamite. John Henry was nearest the fuse. He ran to put it out, but tripped and fell. Oh, I'm hurt bad, he groaned. I can't get up. The fuse burned farther out of reach. Others rushed toward it, but they were too far away. Suddenly, John Henry remembered he still had his hammer in his hand. Down came the hammer, smack on the burning tip. The fuse was out, danger passed. Whew! Sighs of relief filled the smoky tunnel. Woo, help me up, boys, mumbled John Henry. Clearing their way through the cave-in, the men carried him to safety. Some days later, they heard an unfamiliar clatter. Down the tunnel came a group of men with a strange machine. This is a steam drill. It can drill holes faster than any six men combined, a new man bragged. Who can beat that? John Henry stepped forward. Try me. He and Lil Bill took their workplaces. John Henry gripped his hammer. Lil Bill clutched his steel drill. Check the machine, came an order. A nervous hand fell on the switch. In the dark, both sides waited for the signal to start. A hoarse voice counted. One, two, three. The machine shrieked as it started. John Henry swung his hammer, and a crash of steel on steel split the air. Clang! Bang! Clang! The drill got red hot in Lil Bill's hands. He quickly dropped it and picked up another. Hiss! Whistle! Rattle! Men frantically heaved coal into the hungry, roaring engine and poured water into the steaming boiler. Whoop! Clang! Whoop! Bang! John Henry's hammer whistled as he swung it. Chug, chug, clatter, rattled the machine. Hour after hour raced by. The machine was ahead. Hand me that 20-pound hammer, Lil Bill. Harder and faster crashed the hammer. Great chunks of rock fell as John Henry ripped hole after hole into the tunnel wall. The machine rattled and whistled and drilled even faster. Friends doused John Henry and Lil Bill with cold water to keep them going. Then John Henry took a deep breath, <sighs> picked up two sledgehammers, and sang. I'm not really sure how the song went, but here are the words. Ain't no hammer strike such fire, strike like lightning, Lord, and I won't tire. Hammers like this, Lord, there's never been. I'll keep swinging them, Lord, until we win. <laughs> 
John Henry swung both mighty hammers faster and faster. He moved so fast the men could see only a blur and sparks from his striking hammers. His strokes rang out like great heartbeats. At the other side of the tunnel, the machine shrieked, groaned, and rattled and drilled. Then all at once it shook and shuddered, wheezed, and stopped. Frantically, men worked to get it going again, but they couldn't. It had collapsed. John Henry's hammering still rang and echoed through the tunnel with a strong and steady beat. Suddenly, there was a great crash. Light streamed into the dark tunnel. John Henry had broken through. Wild cries of joy burst from the men. Still holding one of his hammers, John Henry stepped out into the glowing light of a dying day. It was the last step he ever took. Even the great heart of John Henry could not bear the strain of his last task. John Henry died with his hammer in his hand. If you listen to the locomotives roaring through the tunnels and across the land, you'll hear them singing, singing of that great still driving man, John Henry. Listen. The end. The Civil War and the Road to Freedom Emancipation When the U.S. Civil War began in 1861, some Americans saw it as an effort to save the Union. Others saw it as the Confederacy's attempt to protect the right of states to make their own decisions. Frederick Douglass insisted that it was about neither of those things. The war now being waged in this land is a war for and against slavery, he said and it can never be effectively put down till one or the other of these vital forces is completely destroyed. Douglas believed black men should be allowed to join the Union Army and fight against the Confederacy. On January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation declaring the end of slavery in the rebel states. Soon after, many of the newly freed men signed up to fight. The Fighting 54th, the first black volunteer unit to be formed during the war was the 54th Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry Regiment. They courageously fought during the failed attempt to capture Fort Wagner in South Carolina. The 54th Massachusetts led the attack and suffered heavy losses. One of its men, Sergeant William Harvey Carney, became the first African American to be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for bravery. 12 black regiments with about 3,500 soldiers were among the troops assembled in Appomattox, Virginia, when Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Union General Ulysses S. Grant on April the 9th, 1865, signaling the end of the war. A total of about 200,000 black men served in the Union Army and Navy with more than 38,000 of them sacrificing their lives in defense of the Union. The Reconstruction Amendments. The period following the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, was called Reconstruction, 1865 through 1877. It included three important constitutional amendments. The 13th Amendment banned slavery and involuntary servitude except as punishment for a crime. The 14th Amendment guaranteed equal protection under the law for all American citizens. The 15th Amendment granted black men the right to vote. 40 acres and a mule. The Emancipation Proclamation had left many of the formerly enslaved with no place to live. Many of them followed the Union Army in search of food and shelter. The Army sent more than 15,000 of them to a refugee camp on Hilton Head, one of the South Carolina Sea Islands. A spokesman for the refugees told Union officers, 
The way we can best take care of ourselves is to have land and turn it and till it by our own labor. In response, General William Tecumseh Sherman issued Special Field Order No. 15 on January 16, 1865, dividing land into 40-acre plots that would be distributed to the newly freed. Two months before Lee's surrender, Congress established the Freedmen's Bureau to help emancipated people adjust to their new lives. It offered freedmen a chance to lease abandoned lands in plots not more than 40 acres. A week after the war ended, President Lincoln was assassinated. The new president, Andrew Johnson, ended the policy and returned most of the land to the Southerners who had owned it before the war. For generations of African Americans, 40 acres and a mule symbolized the broken promises of their government. Congressmen, during Reconstruction, black men served in political office for the first time. They served at the local, state, and national levels. Hiram Revels of Mississippi and Joseph Rainey of South Carolina became the first black men to serve in Congress in 1870. Blanche K. Bruce, also from Mississippi, became the first black man to serve a full term in the Senate in 1874. In 1872, the seven black members of Congress gathered to pose for a historic portrait. When Reconstruction ended in 1877, African Americans throughout the South were once again denied the right to vote. All but two of their elected representatives were forced out of office, and by 1901, both houses of Congress were once again completely white. Do you know a mysterious black hole in outer space actually can't be seen, but for the very first time in 2019, scientists from the University of New Mexico produced the first image. How is that possible? Read more to find out. Okay, and now it's time to say goodbye. Let's practice saying goodbye in all four languages we have learned so far. Are you ready? How about sign language first? Next, Swahili. Kwa Heri. Next, Japanese. Sayonara. And last but not least, Korean. Ang Yang.